when the first Western explorers went to Asia in the Middle Ages, they came back and gave reports of fantastic stories about a, a great god they had seen in the temples called the Budu. And then later, when people in the West began to learn more about the Buddha, they were fascinated by his life and legends because he seemed to parallel Jesus in so many ways. The stories of Jesus and Buddha have some remarkable similarities, as we'll see tonight. In the late 19th century, Edwin Arnold published his epic poem about the life of the Buddha entitled The Light of Asia. The book sold hundreds of thousands of copies and became a bestseller at that time. The popularity of this book and the interest in the Buddha in the 19th century stemmed in part from the fact that the story of the Buddha seemed to echo themes from the story of Jesus and provided an attractive spiritual model that people thought fit in with the modern age. In the Buddha, people found what seemed to be a more rational and human savior figure. So in this talk, I want to look at some of these parallels between the stories and teachings of Jesus and Buddha and ask, what do they mean and what is their significance for us today, these parallels? First, we'll start with some the names and dates. The Buddha mean, is a title, which means the enlightened one, of course. And the name of the Buddha before he became the enlightened one was Gautama Siddhartha. And the usual dates given for him are 563 to 483 BCE. And Jesus is the Christ, and the usual dates for him are the 4 BCE to 30 CE, or something around those dates. Let's start with the, the, the life and legends of Jesus and the Buddha and the birth stories. The birth stories of both the Buddha and Jesus are marked by lots of miraculous events. In the ancient world, there were many stories of remarkable persons and of gods who were believed to have, to have descended to earth. And the stories of both Jesus and Buddha tell the story about uh, a descent from the heavens into the world for the sake of humanity. In his, in his previous life, the Buddha lived in the heaven of the gods and looked down on earth. He'd been reborn in that, in that level. He looked down on earth and decided to take a human body to bring deliverance to the world. The births of both figures are miraculous, marked by amazing signs, angels, deities. Angels appear to Mary to announce the coming of the child. The Buddha's mother had a dream about a white elephant. The legend says that she had a dream, and in the dream she saw a white elephant carrying a lotus, and the white elephant went around the bed on which she was sleeping and took up residence in her womb. And after this, she consulted soothsayers who told her she was going to have a remarkable child, and so she waited until uh, the child would be born. And when Gautama was born, he immediately stood up and began to make several steps, began to walk. And this is the Buddha down here in the corner of the picture, and he's walking in the four directions of the compass, and each place he, t he steps, a lotus flower sprang up, and that's what these white things are. You can't see very good there, but it's, the Buddha's down there. And as soon as he was born, this is a statue, which you can see better. The Buddha held up his hand, gave the sign of peace, and said, this is my last birth. I've been born for the, for the liberation of humanity. Um, so this is fairly unusual. You know, the parents were fairly surprised. And uh, <laughs> uh, angels and devas celebrated the births. And, uh, and to figure out what was going on, uh, wise men came to uh, visit, the, visit both of the, to visit both of these children and to acknowledge their births. In the Buddha's case, his, his parents, the, the king and queen, summoned Brahmins to come and uh, tell them what it meant and what the future, uh, you know, predict the future for their child. And in Jesus' case, of course, we know the story about the Magi coming and, uh, and visiting uh, the child. And then there are these stories, these two interesting stories of both Jesus and the Buddha about an elderly sage coming to visit the child. And the stories are very similar. Uh, in, the, in the Buddha's case, the infant Gautama is visited by a sage named Asita, who comes, who is supposed to be a very wise and uh, insightful, uh, enlightened sage. And he comes, and as soon as he sees the child, he starts to cry. His parents are upset and worried. Why is he crying? Why is he crying when he sees this, this new child? And they ask him, and he says he, this, he's crying because he knows that Gautama will become the Buddha for our age. And he's crying because he is old, and he knows he won't live long enough to see the Buddha's enlightenment and his teaching 
uh, the Dharma for the age. And in the Bible, the story says the infant Jesus was visited by a very similar sage named Simeon, who said, when he saw uh, the infant Jesus, said, Lord, let thy servant now depart in peace, for my eyes have seen the Savior who will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to thy people Israel. So the birth was marked by all these events and very similar stories. Um, and then in their careers, the scriptures and legends say that, that Jesus and Buddha had similar careers as spiritual seekers and teachers. Both Jesus and Gautama left home and family at an early age and embarked on spiritual quests. They lived essentially homeless lives, wandering from place to place and following spiritual practices and teaching others. They lived simply, practicing asceticism and spiritual quests. Both Gautama and Jesus are said to have encountered challenges in their quest. The Gospel tell us that Jesus went into the desert after his baptism by John and there fasted in the wilderness. And during this time, he was accosted by Satan, who tempted him to abandon his quest in exchange for great power and authority. But Jesus, of course, rejected Satan's temptations. Similarly, the Buddhist scriptures tell us the story of Gautama being assailed by the demon Mara during his quest. Mara is a figure whose, whose job in Buddhist mythology is to keep beings trapped in the round of samsara. And so Mara is concerned that the Buddha is going to point the way out of samsara for himself and for others. And so he has to come and try to uh, detract the Buddha and keep him from uh, achieving this goal. So Mara offers him wealth and pleasure and power. And he tries to tempt him. He, Mara sends his daughters who are beautiful to tempt Gautama and that doesn't work. And he gives, offers him palaces and wealth and authority, and the Buddha rejects, Gautama rejects all this. Uh, but Gautama resists, and he rejects Mara simply by reaching, he's sitting in meditation, he reaches down and touches the ground. This is a very famous pose you'll see sometimes in the statues of the Buddha, and this is called the Buddha calling the earth to witness. So he reached down and touched the ground, he didn't have to say anything to Mara, but the cosmos sort of echoed and uh, you know, told Mara that he should leave uh, the future Buddha alone. In their careers, both Jesus and Buddha are depicted as traveling from village to village, teaching and helping people. They both assemble a, a group of disciples and lay the groundwork for, um, for religious reformations and teachings. Jesus said to his followers, he said, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And the Buddha said a very similar thing to his followers. He said, The wise do not delight in an abode. Like swans who have left their lake, they leave the, their house and home. So they taught their followers to abandon all desires for the world and for security. They taught them to live otherworldly lives and demanded that they sever ties to the world and devote themselves to this spiritual quest. Both Jesus and the Buddha also are reported to have performed miracles. They're said to have done various kinds of miraculous deeds. They performed miracles and miraculous things happened around them when they were there. The biography of the Buddha says that when he entered the city, the elephants trumpeted, the birds sang, and at that moment the blind recovered their sight and the deaf their hearing. Jesus did miracles, healing miracles, and physical miracles like walking on water, and miracles of feeding people and helping people. Buddha did similar, similar miracles in the tradition of the yogis in India, that had always, where they'd always been able to do them. Miracles such as walking on water, rising into the air, and reading people's minds. There's a story about once the Buddha was traveling and he came to the river, and the ferry was not there, so he couldn't cross the river. So he simply he waited for the ferry, and the ferry finally came, but the ferry wouldn't let him on without any money. I guess the ferry was an atheistic ferry guy or something, and so he wouldn't let the Buddha on, or he was anti-agnostic religion. And so uh, the Buddha just simply uh, walked across the surface of the river and to the other side. Um, the Buddha did fewer healing miracles, but he is said to have done some. There's a story that once he produced water that was used to cure the blindness of his stepmother. 
But there are also stories about the Buddha refusing to do healings. And there's one very important story about the Buddha, uh, a healing that, that he didn't do. It said that once there was a woman uh, named Kisa Gotami who had a child who was about three years old and died. And she was very, his only child, and she was very distraught that the child had died. And so she carried the child to various doctors to see what was wrong, to try to get them to heal the child, but the, the child had already died. And the doctors said, you know, there's nothing we can do. And finally, somebody said, you should go and talk to the Buddha. So she took her child and went to the Buddha, hoping that the Buddha would you know, revive the child. And the Buddha said, uh, very compassionately said, I'll, I'll be glad to help you if you can go into the village and get a mustard seed from a family where there's never been a death. And if you can do that, then come back and we can perform the healing. And so she goes into the village and goes from house to house, and eventually it sinks in that death is a part of life and there aren't any families that haven't ever had a death. So she comes back and meets the Buddha and is reconciled to what's happened and eventually becomes a Buddhist nun and uh, lives in, in the Sangha. But there are stories where, where Jesus and Buddha are said to have healed people, and uh, then they tell people that their faith is what healed them. They say that, you know, that I didn't do it, but it's your faith that's made you well. Um, and there are other stories about people uh, clamoring to, to be in the room or on the street where the Buddha or Jesus passed by, because being in their presence would affect healing. And these are, you find stories like this about both teachers. Um, there's one interesting parallel miracle story about uh, disciples, of, a disciple of Jesus and a disciple of the Buddha being able to walk on water by having faith in the teacher. And these are two, the story from the Bible is probably familiar to you. It's a story about Peter. And Peter answered Jesus, says, Lord, if it is you, he, Peter's in the boat and he sees Jesus on the shore. He says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got to the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you're the Son of God. So Peter was doing good until he lost faith, and then the, you know, the, he sank. Um, this, story, this is the story from the Buddhist uh, from the Jatakas and on the Buddhist side, says he arrived at the bank of the river in the evening. As the ferryman had drawn the boat up the beach, he had and gone to listen to the doctrine. The disciples saw no boat at the ferry. So finding joy and making the Buddha the object of his meditation, he walked across the river. His feet did not sink in the water. He went as though on the surface of the earth, as long as he was meditating on the Buddha. But when he reached the middle, he saw waves. And then his joy in meditating on the Buddha grew small and his feet began to sink. But making firm again his joy in, in the Buddha, making, making firm again his joy in meditating on the Buddha, he went on the surface of the water, entered the temple, and saluted the teacher and sat on one side. So very similar stories about disciples having faith in the teacher, being able to do miracles also. Um, but there are also stories about Jesus and the Buddhas being said to have played, played down their abilities to do miracles at times because they didn't want the people to visit them, to view them as just miracle workers, or to come to see them just to see them do miracles, uh, as wonder workers. The Buddha is reported to have said that he knew how to do three kinds of miracles. Magical powers like levitation, mental powers such as we would call ESP, and the highest kind of miracle, he said, teaching someone the Dharma, or the path to liberation. He said, I much prefer to do the latter, teaching someone the Dharma. Um, and there are cases where the Buddha chastises his disciples because the disciples are trying to do miracles or doing miracles in a village to impress the people. And he says, this is not what we're about. We're not about here to do miracles. We're here to, to point the way to liberation. So, this is, so these, this, the, the ability to do miracles is one kind of theme that runs through both teachings and uh, on the Buddhist side, it's, very, it's a very Indian theme, a very yogic theme, that, uh, that enlightened beings can do miracles, uh, but that miracles are a sidetrack, or a, you know, a, a sort of a detour. And if you get off on the detour, you miss your, your, your progress to the path. 
And then the deaths of the two masters are also marked by similar events, by earthquakes and miraculous occurrences. This is a statue of the Buddha entering Nirvana, which is at Poonarawa in Sri Lanka, a huge stone statue carved out of the cliff behind it. Um, in about the 8th, 9th century uh, of the Common Era. Um, after their deaths, both teachers were worshipped by their followers uh, and their relics were enshrined in various kinds of temples and shrines. Like this one at Sanchi, famous uh, stupa in, for the relics of the Buddha and his disciples. Here you see some Buddhists circumambulating a stupa of the Buddha in Sri Lanka, uh, worshiping the Buddha. So how to account for these similarities in the life story? How do we explain these similarities in the life stories, especially very similar stories like the one about the two disciples walking on water and the stories about their descending to earth and setting out a path? Um, three suggestions. I'll give three suggestions. They, one is that these are themes that you can find in hero legends in all kinds of world literature. Stories about a hero who ventures out to establish the good, he encounters a challenge, uh, and he is threatened by evil forces, and then he eventually overcomes the evil forces and fights to establish goodness and righteousness. So, you know, there's a, kind of the general theme of the hero. You can also say it was a standard way of memorializing great beings in the ancient world. To some extent, all great figures, kings, emperors, uh, teachers, uh, had, are, are said to have had miraculous lives by their, by their followers. Uh, and this you know, is another way of explaining why, why this was the case. In India, this legendary pattern could be called, is, is seen a lot of times in, applied to the Buddha and to Krishna and other deities in India. The idea that an avatar deity brings down religion to earth and restores access to the sacred for the sake of solving the problems of humanity. So there's an Indian model that you know, we could extrapolate. So you know, there are various explanations here as to why these stories should be so similar. But the similarity gets more interesting if we look at the teachings also. And I want to look at some of the teachings, not just the legends about their, their lives told by their followers. Many of the teachings of Jesus and Buddha also seem similar, especially the ethical teachings. Um, if we compare the teachings given in the biblical Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew's Gospel and also in Luke's Gospel, they're called the Sermon on the Plain, and in the Buddhist scripture, the Dhammapada, we find some really interesting parallels. For example, um, this parallel verse from the Dhammapada, Consider others as yourself, and the famous verse from, from the gospel, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Very similar teachings, uh, not so surprising. I mean, great teachers, lots of teachers taught this, uh, similar kind of thing, but very similar kind of teachings. Um, they also taught the idea, they also taught similar ideas about cultivating a peaceful mind no matter what happens, being compassionate and nonviolent. So you find these sayings in these kind of parallel sayings. Jesus saying, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other also. And the Buddha saying, if anyone hits you with his hand or with a stick or a knife, you should abandon any desires and utter no evil words. Very similar kind of approaches to how to deal with enemies and attitude, the attitude you should have toward violence. Of course, they, they basically said both teachers were against any kind of killing and any kind of violence. He who does not harm any living creature and does not take part in killing, he I declare as a holy person, the Buddha said. That this is the basic injunction for, uh, for living, not harming, no violence. The Buddha followed the ethical precepts he had inherited from Hinduism. But if you look at the Buddha's teachings carefully, you see the Buddha really changes things a bit from the way it was in Hinduism. The Buddha raises the bar by teaching what there was most important is not just the outward act, but the inner intention. One should not only not kill any living beings, but one should cultivate non-anger and non-violence. Um, and this, so the, the emphasis in, in the Buddhist approach to this was the emphasis on the intention 
And if you didn't, if you intended, if you didn't intend to harm anything, you, you didn't get bad karma. So for example, to give an example, in Hinduism, the idea is that if you accidentally uh, kill something, an insect, say, and you didn't, and you get bad karma for that. But the Buddha said, if you accidentally, if you, if you're walking down the road, walking down the, down the walk, and you accidentally step on an insect, and you didn't intend to step on the insect, you, you don't get bad karma. So the, the idea is, the Buddha shifted the, 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 the focus from the outer act to the intention. To, and it, this is part of his, his, uh, his teaching about what's important is purifying your mind. And so the, the actions, the ethical actions, are really ways of shaping your mind. The Buddha also said it is not sufficient to, to just not tell lies, but one should not use harsh speech or think evil of another. You should try to conquer anger by non-anger. If we look at Jesus' ethical teachings, we say that Jesus really made a similar ethical shift from outer ac outward action to inner intention. In this saying from the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you shall be liable to judgment. So it's not enough just to not kill, but it's not, you shouldn't even be angry. The question is, is, what intention do you have? What's your attitude? Both, teaching, both teachers had very similar teachings about doing good and living in the world. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Hatred do not cease in this world by hating, but by love. This is an eternal truth. The Buddha followed an ancient yogic teaching in India that taught that desires lead to suffering. Desires are the, sort of one of the key things that, uh, that keep us trapped in the round of samsara. He said, people who are pursued by lust run around like a hunted hare. They act wrongly and suffer and suffer again. But a wise person is free from lust, is free from greed, and, free from sin, and freed from sin. So overcoming desire and overcoming lust is very important. And again, it's a matter of shifting the ethical focus from the outer acts to the inner intention. In a similar way, Jesus taught, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. A similar move, shifting from outward to inner, raising the bar of the ethical demand. In the Buddha's case, this ethical ideal is spelled out in the first two verses of the Dhammapada. And these, I think, sort of show where the Buddha is going and why, he's, why he's, he's shaping the ethic in this way. These are the famous first two verse, twin verses from the first, part, first chapter of the Dhammapada. What we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday. And our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. If a person speaks or acts with an impure mind, suffering follows him as the wheel of the cart follows the ox that draws the cart. And the second verse is the parallel but change. What we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. If a person speaks or acts with a pure mind, joy follows him as his own shadow. So the, the centrality of the mind, the centrality of purifying the mind in the, uh, in the quest. And the Buddhists said this is, you know, we think about the, the quest is the quest for enlightenment and wisdom. But the Buddha said the actions and the intentions are very much tied up with the wisdom. And you have to purify both the outer actions and the inner, inner intentions. Both teachers also said, talked about the idea of, of not being anxious and living, m being mindful and living in the present. And this is an important theme that you, can, you see in both the Sermon on the Mount and in, uh, and in the Buddhist teachings. Mindfulness represents a central part of the Buddhist path. Uh, once when somebody came to the Buddhist temple and asked him, why are your monks so happy? Why do your monks seem so pleased, so, so joyful? And he said, the Buddha, the Buddha said to, to the person who's questioning, he said, my followers are happy because they neither repent the past nor live in the future, but are mindful of the present moment. This idea of being, living in the present, being mindful of the present moment. And you have this seemingly similar teaching from Jesus, a very sort of parallel teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. Where Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. So live in the present, focus on the present, and don't be concerned about these other things. 
Be content. This is really more about not being anxious, which is about living in the present and not worrying about the future, about not being attached. Um, another virtue that, that, that the Buddha taught, which is connected to this, to this idea of not being anxious and living in the present, is the idea of equanimity. Equanimity was a supreme virtue for the Buddha. It represents a central idea in his teaching, in the ethical teaching. And here's a, a verse where the Buddha teaches this. It says, good people walk on. Whatever befall, wise people are never elated by praise or depressed by blame. And this was a very strong uh, idea in perfecting yourself and moving toward the goal that you should be able to live in the present moment without praise or blame, just enjoying the present moment, not being anxious about your life in the same way that, that Jesus said. Okay, now, how, sh how should we understand, how should we interpret these, these similarities in the teachings? How can we explain the uh, similarities in the lives, and especially in the teachings of Buddha and Jesus? What should we make of those? A lot of, a lot of explanations have been given. A lot of people have suggested ideas about how you explain these teachings, and what, what you should say about uh, why they're the, this, these parallels. Um, one idea is to say that there was a direct influence of the Buddha on Jesus. That Jesus was influenced by Buddhist ideas that were present uh, in the Middle East at his time. Um, and it's pretty clear that there was a Buddhist presence in the Middle East in the time of Jesus and before. Um, for example, the Emperor Ashoka, who was a great emperor in, uh, in India about 300 years after the life of the Buddha, after the death of the Buddha, um, conquered the uh, whole of the subcontinent of India and, ex and beyond uh, through the Dharma, became a big disciple of the Buddha. And he sent out missionaries, Dharma emissaries, to various lands. He sent some Dharma emissaries to, to the West, who came to Alexandria and Egypt, and uh, spread e Buddhist teachings in Egypt and Greece, and may have uh, helped pre prepare the ground for uh, Jesus coming in contact with Buddhism. We know that Buddhism was prominent in the Eastern Greek world, it became the official region, religion of the Eastern Greek successor kingdoms to Ale where Alexander the Great went. Uh, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom and several prominent Greek Buddhist missionaries are known and, uh, and talked about in, in the literature. The Indo-Greek king Menander converted to Buddhism and was regarded, was regarded as one of the great patrons of Buddhism in the West. It was today kind of Bactria, was, this country called Bactria is today kind of Afghanistan and Tajikistan and uh, over toward Persia. And there's a famous book in the Buddhist scriptures about the questions of King Melinda, about Menander's questioning the Buddhist monks. So we know that Buddhism was around and Buddhism had been spread. They, archaeologists found Buddhist gravestones from the Ptolemaic period in Alexandria and Egypt. And uh, they're decorated with depictions of the Dharma wheel showing the Buddhists were living in Hellenistic Egypt at the time Christianity uh, began. So, you know, it was around in that part of the world, so, you know, it's possible that uh, the Buddha, uh, excuse me, that Jesus heard about Buddhist ideas. But then there are other ideas that say, other, other people have written to talk about the idea that Jesus may have gone to India. He may have actually traveled to India uh, during what are called the lost years of Jesus, the years that the Bible, between the time he was a child and the, when he was 30 years old, when he begins to, his public ministry. And there's stories about this. Uh, that Jesus traveled to India and learned from the Buddhist and the yogis, and maybe, you know, that's where he learned to do miracles or something. It's not impossible that, that Jesus went to India. It's, I, I personally don't think it's real likely, but there were caravans, and people argue that the caravans traveled along the Silk Route from the Middle East to India and China, and they traveled, you know, through, through Egypt and through, through uh, Arabia, and Jesus could have traveled with them or just met people who had, and these caravans in their travels certainly encountered uh, Buddhism. Uh, this is a picture of the Bamiyan Valley in Afghanistan. And I don't know if you can see these cliffs along the far side there are pocked with caves that, uh, where Buddhist monks lived in, in traditional time, in ancient times. Uh, ascetic monks lived there and lived along the trail runs right at the base, the, the Silk Route runs right at the base of those cliffs. And as they came through there, uh, there were Buddhist uh, monasteries and temples and the travelers would have uh, taken rest there and been, you know, talked to by the Buddhist monks. 
and the Buddhist monks built big statues of the Buddha alongside the, alongside the, the Silk Route uh, as kind of uh, billboards advertising the Buddha, advertising Buddhism to the travelers. These are the Bamiyan Buddha statues, which actually post-date Jesus, about the fifth century of uh, common era statues, but there were early Buddha, earlier Buddha statues there too. These are the famous statues that, uh, huge uh, classic statues of the Buddha that were destroyed, have been destroyed several times in history, attempted to be destroyed by various conquerors. Uh, the latest conquerors were, what about 15, 20 years ago, the Taliban decided these were idolatry and thought they should be destroyed. Uh, but there is a project underway to try to restore them. This is a similar statue from a little bit, from about the same period, a little bit later in Sri Lanka to show you what they might have looked like when they were, when they were built, these huge Buddha statues alongside the trail. There are also legends saying that Jesus survived the crucifixion and later returned to India and died there in Kashmir. And uh, so that he went to India in his later life also. Uh, and there is a, there's a writing and there are videos around that talk about uh, there being a temple in Kashmir that claims to be, claims to enshrine the grave of one named Yeshua, who is Jesus, the claim is Jesus, who came there and lived for many years teaching in India. Uh, this also seems, seems a little more, un, more unlikely than the, than the fact that he went to, in, the idea that he went to India as a youth. And it also wouldn't provide an explanation for how there were similar sayings in the Gospels, but it is interesting, that the idea to think that Jesus might have traveled to India in that, in that way. Um, another way that, uh, that, I mean, you know, we, we tend to think of, of religions being in watertight compartments. And that it, it was, you know, we think that, you know, could Buddhism have influenced Christianity at all? You know, they're, they're separate religions. But we know actually that there were Buddhist influences on Christianity uh, at, at, after Jesus' life and uh, in various ways. Elaine Pagels, a New Testament scholar, argues that Gnostic Christianity seems to resonate with Buddhist ideas. And if her, she studied the Gospel of Thomas, one of the... Uh, non-canonical Gospels, and indicates that the Gospel of Thomas reflects a Gnostic ideal that seems very similar to the Buddhist teachings and uh, may have been influenced by Buddhism. And there are clear examples from, from a later period that show that, that there were Buddhist or Indian, Indian influences on early Christianity. One of the ones people have, it's pretty easy to see, I think, is the idea of the rosary. Where did Christianity get the idea of the rosary? But if you look, the rosary beads had been in India for years, for hundreds of thousands of years. And people had used them for meditation and prayer. And, and this influence eventually was, could have been picked up by Christianity. Another question people have raised about monastic life. Uh, where did the, why did Christian uh, followers take up a monastic life, living uh, homeless lives, ascetic lives, meditating in the desert, living this life of poverty and asceticism? very much like the tradition that the Buddha and uh, holy individuals in India had followed for hundreds of years. So there are clear borrowings in various ways, so it's not impossible that the early church was influenced by Buddhism and shaped the Gospels in that way. But I think the most likely explanation, the, the best explanation to me, it seems, is that uh, Jesus and Buddha were both what the New Testament scholar Marcus Borg has called spirit persons, spiritual seekers and teachers, who taught similar paths to salvation or liberation. And we can see that their ethical teachings are integral to this, and we can see that their, their ethical teachings are tied in with their spiritual goals that they teach their followers. And I think this is where these sayings back here, we, the Buddha's spiritual goal, what he was teaching his people to do, his followers to do, uh, was this, this is his words. So his last words were, be diligent and mindful and virtuous, O monks, seek enlightenment. Make the Dharma your lamp and the Dharma your refuge. This is the goal. And the way to do that is to purify the mind and to practice enlightenment. And the Buddha's, and the, excuse me, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' injunction to his followers was to seek the kingdom of God. Do not be worried about the desires of the world, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. And this is a famous passage from, from the uh, Sermon on the Mount, it actually follows the passage we read, we read a minute ago about do not be anxious. Do not be anxious about things of the world, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is pretty clear, and, and most scholars agree, was the major theme, the major focus of Jesus' teaching. It was the purpose that he was trying to achieve. 
The question is, what does it mean? What does the kingdom of God mean? What does it mean for Jesus to talk about the kingdom of God? Is that anything like what the Buddha was talking about? The traditional interpretation, and most traditional interpreters would say that Jesus meant the traditional Jewish understanding of this kingdom as an apocalyptic breaking in of God and a restoration of the rule of God on earth. In the context of that time that Jesus was living in, it would have meant an overthrowing of the, the ruling Roman powers and return to the way things were when David was king and ruled in accord with the will of God. An eschatological kingdom that would appear soon. This is the traditional interpretation. But other interpreters, other Christian interpreters have said that Jesus really meant, if you read it closely, that the kingdom was a spiritual or internal reality. And there's biblical support for this view, a very famous passage that supports this view. And to get to that, we may have to go through the Bamiyan Valley again, but uh, um, this passage. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or look, it is there. For in truth, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God signifies an internal spiritual reality that can be lived. So this seems very similar to the Buddha's idea of achieving the Dharma, seeking the goal, seeking enlightenment. So this same idea of, of inner purification and inner spiritual reality. So let me just sort of sum up this and then we can have some questions. The significance, it seems to me, of these parallels between the, the stories about the, the two teachers and especially the saying, the similar, very similar sayings by the two teachers, and lots of other sayings, you know, that we couldn't, I didn't, you know, put down here. Lots of other very similar parallel sayings. The parallels in these lives and teachings, uh, I think, are significant for us because they can inspire, inspire us in our own spiritual search. They provide a base that we can use for interfaith dialogue. And they, they clearly show that it's possible to learn from other traditions. They provide spiritual guidance for Christians and Buddhists. I'll cite two very key examples here of uh, contemporary Buddhist and Christian teachers. Uh, the contemporary Buddhist monk and author Thich Nhat Hanh has written and compared the kingdom of God to the goal of the pure land in Buddhism. The pure land can be seen either as a heavenly realm or can be seen as an internal purity of mind. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh often says, uh, we had a nice meditation, a nice walk, and we lived in the pure land this afternoon. So this idea of, uh, of being in the pure land here and now. Thich Nhat Hanh says, the similarities of Jesus and the Buddha mean for him that Jesus and the Buddha are both my spiritual ancestors. And I can touch the living Christ and the living Buddha. And he has a very interesting book, if you haven't read it, uh, called Living Christ, Living Buddha. Or is it Living Buddha, Living Christ? I forget which way it is. But a uh, very interesting book, comparing the two and talking about the significance of the, of the similarities. Um, and also, the late Christian monk and author Thomas Merton said that we can compare the Christian idea of having the mind of Christ with the Buddhist idea of having the Buddha mind. Both are expressions of the goal of wisdom and a pure mind. And he notes that comparing the teachings can help us, regain, help us regain a healthy and natural balance in our understanding of the spiritual life. This statue, I should say, is also in... In Sri Lanka, this is the same one we saw before. It's the Alkana Buddha, which is near Polonarwa, excuse me, near Anuradhapura. It's about an 8th century statue, a very famous uh, <coughs> carved statue of the Buddha teaching. Yes? I was just wondering if you um, see any similarities between honoring the fe feminine or the sacred feminine between the two, as Jesus may be honored and Mary Magdalene was somehow the sacred feminine to him. Did the Buddha have any honoring of the feminine that you know? Well, he had feminine to say, he had women disciples. He admitted women to the order of monk, order of uh, the Sangha, he, which was a very controversial thing. Uh, and there are stories about the Buddha doing that, which say uh, that his disciple Ananda had to sort of persuade him to do it, but, but he did admit uh, nuns, there were monks and nuns, and he. There are very famous stories about, uh, uh, if you read in the, the, some of the, the scriptures of the Buddhists, talk about very enlightened women, who, women monastics, who, who were the advisors to kings and were very prominent in the Sangha and in the, 
in the Buddhist world at that time. So, I mean, in that sense, he, he was very open to uh, women pursuing the spiritual path and, as well as men and tried to encourage that. I don't know if that answer, answers the question, but uh, there's not a, not, a figure like, not a figure like the Virgin Mary or anything in, in Buddhism, except that his stepmother was the first nun, the, the, his stepmother who raised him, because his mother died a week after he was born, and his stepmother raised him, and she was the first one ordained as a nun, and she, very famous, Prajapati. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, in regard to Jesus speaking about the afterlife, or the kingdom of God yet to come, right. so that the kingdom of God is here and now, but also there's a future kingdom coming where everything will be made right. How does that, do you think, parallel the idea of karma? So that is there a place called heaven which the followers of Jesus seem to believe in? Is there, is there a place for, called heaven for the Buddhists, you mean? Or? No, yes. So that, well, how does the idea of karma, which keeps recycling, whereas Jesus seemed his followers to believe that the kingdom of heaven was going to be a permanent place somewhere in the future. Right. So even though the kingdom of God is here and now, right. it's also going to be in the future as well. Yeah, that's, it's kind of hard to balance those two, isn't it? And to, to see exactly how you interpret that. It did, and are they, are, they, are they two separate ideals that kind of become conflated? You have to keep them both? I don't know. But so on the Buddhist side, the Buddhists do have the idea of heaven, have an idea of heaven. Because in the realm of, of reincarnation, samsara, there are various levels on which you can be reborn. You can be reborn on the human level, reborn on the animal level, uh, the hellish level, or if your karma is very good, you can come back and as a deity, as a deva, and live on one of and there are various sort of a hierarchy of heavenly realms. You can be reborn with heavenly realms, which is what the Buddha was doing, what Gautama was doing before he came back to earth to become the Buddha. He looked down, he was in the heavenly realm. He says, okay, I'm going to go down and take my last birth in the world as a, a teacher for the enlightenment of the world. So there are heavenly realms, and, and there are Buddhists who uh, do karma with the idea of being born in the heavenly realm and, and enjoying that. So yes, but it's not ultimate. The idea finally is that you should overcome that altogether in the Buddhist side idea. You should try to get out of samsara altogether and yeah. become one with you know, the infinite. The Dharma, the Dharmakaya, yeah. What is the explanation, or maybe I'm just not aware, of why we're so aware of Jesus' followers, his disciples, and I don't know a single disciple of Buddha by name today? Yeah. yeah. Well, if you were in a Buddhist country, you would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in Sri Lanka, there are lots of people named Ananda, and Ananda was the Buddha's chief disciple. And there, you know, lots of, you know, it's like it's, Ananda is like the name John or Peter or in, in Western. So I mean, in, in Buddhist culture, Buddhist civilization, they're they were much aware of the, the Ananda yes. and, and Sariputta and all the famous disciples. Yeah, I think it, you know it's in the literature and in, in the culture. Yeah, and we, and I think we in the West, when we've studied about Buddhism, we haven't sort of picked up that sort of part of the tradition as much, you're right. Christ throughout his life emphasized his relationship with the Father, that none come to the Father but through him, that he and the Father were the same. Um, what was Buddha's relationship with God in his teaching? Was Buddha's relationship with God? In his teachings, yes. In, in the Buddha's teachings? Yes. Okay. That's very interesting, I mean most people say Buddhism is an atheistic religion. It's really sort of not atheistic. It's, it's what some people call non-theistic. The Buddha doesn't really reject the gods. And if you go to a Buddhist country, you'll see that. You go to a Buddhist temple in Thailand, Sri Lanka, various places, there are lots of gods. If you go into the big Buddhist temples in Sri Lanka, um, there's the Buddha statue at the end of the room. But often in the, in the side rooms, there are statues of the gods. Like you find in churches here, there are statues of saints. So in the Buddhist uh, view of the gods, the, the Buddha simply says the gods exist. But he says the gods are not ultimate. The gods are in this cycle of samsara. They're reborn on a higher level than we are. They have more power than we do, but they're not ultimate. Uh, and so 
it's useful for Buddhists to placate the gods, to worship the gods, to venerate the gods, because the gods can do things for you in a material sense in the world. If you have problems or you need a job or whatever, a concrete problem, the gods can sometimes help you with that, things the Buddha doesn't address. But if you're interested in achieving enlightenment and purity of mind, the Buddha is the one you should talk to, not the gods. Uh, so that's sort of the relationship. And yeah, there's, very fam there's another famous story about the Buddha and the gods. It's a good story. Uh, the great god of, uh, the god in the Buddha's time was thought to be the, the father god of the whole pantheon of Indian gods. And remember, the Buddha is operating in India. He's, he's part of the whole Hindu, Indian religion context. He, he, there wasn't a Buddhism in the Buddha's day. He's, he's a yogi in the yogic tradition, and so he's living in this context of all these gods. Buddhism as an ism, as an organized tradition, comes after the Buddha, and the Buddha sets the way, but you know, in his time there wasn't there. So he's in the Buddha's day, the great god who's thought to be the creator of all the other gods, the father of all the other gods, is the god called Brahma. And Brahma is a god who is supposed to be the creator of the world. And he lives in the highest of the heavens in this great palace, you know, up in the heavens, and uh, watches over the world. And so the story says that one day there was a monk in the Buddha's Sangha who wanted to know, who became curious about how, the world and about how, how things operate. And he said, and he began asking questions. He said, how did things come into being? How did the world come into being? What rules the world? And how does the world operate? That's sort of a rough translation. That's more or less what he said. Um, and so he went to various teachers. And he went to teachers and said, uh, I've had this question. I've been meditating, thinking about this. And I wonder, how did the world come into being? And how does it operate? And what keeps the world going? And you know, these kind of things. And he asked various teachers. And the teachers said, well, I, you know, that's a big question. I don't know. You should go ask the guy down the road. You go ask him. And he, they'd send him various people. And finally, he, he was sent, uh, let's see, he, finally, he's told that you should go up and ask the gods. He has, he's, he's one of the Buddha's disciples. So he has these, some miraculous powers of his own. So he, he uses his power to levitate and ascends up into the lower heavens of the gods. Goes up there and he talks, sees, meets the gods, and he asks the gods this question. They say, why have you come? He said, well, I've asked this question. How did the world come into being? What was, how was the world made? What is it made of? And how does it keep going? And the gods say, you know, this is a really hard question. You should go up and ask the gods on the next level. We're just down, this is just sort of the basic level. The guys on the next level know a lot more than we do. Go up there and ask them. So he goes to the next level of the gods and they say the same thing. You know, they, well, you know that's hard. Go, go, you know, go up one more. Go up to the next floor. They, they know all the answers up there. So, and there's a hierarchy, six or seven levels of the heavens of the gods. Finally, they say, you know, you have to go ask Brahma. Brahma is the father god. He's, he's the creator. Go up and ask him. Ask him how it worked. So he goes up to Brahma. And he gets to Brahma, and there's this huge palace. And it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz, in a way. You know, this huge marble palace. And all the gods, the great gods, are seated on either side in their retinue, in their, in their seats. And Brahma is on his throne at the end. And this monk walks in, looks around, walks down the hall, and, and stands in front of Brahma. And Brahma says, why are you here? And uh, something like that. And, and, and the monk says, uh, I have come to ask this question. I've come all this way. How did the world come into being? What keeps it going? How does it, how does it operate? What are the basic laws? And, and Brahma says, I am Brahma, great Brahma, maker and ruler of all beings who have been and are to be. And that's it. And the monk says, that's cool, but you know, I have this question. Uh, how did this world come into being? And, how does it, and he asks this question several times, and Brahma says, I am Brahma, great Brahma, make a ruler, and you know, same spiel. And finally, the monk says, finally, Brahma says, come here. So he takes him over the side and says, listen, I don't know the answer to this stuff. Uh, when I was born, when I was reborn up here on this level, there wasn't anybody else here. And finally, God, their gods started appearing, and they saw me and said, oh, you must be the creator. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, so they built this palace and all these things. And if I tell them I don't know these answers, they'll all be de you know, depressed and disappointed. So I can't say anything about this. You should go back and talk to the Buddha. He's the one who knows how the universe operates and how all things work. So this is a classic. It was, you know, it's a funny story, and it was intended to be funny then. It's, the Buddhists were making fun of the Indian uh, cosmology and said, you know, the gods are there. They exist, they're greater than we are as human beings, but they aren't ultimate. They don't know the ultimate answers. They haven't sought the Dharma, they haven't sought the truth, haven't sought to escape from samsara. If you want to do that, go and ask the Buddha. And so this is, this is how the Buddha saw the gods, basically, and how the Buddhists see the gods. They're helpful, but not ultimate. It's a long answer, sorry. <laughs> um, Buddha talks about um, karma. Um, did Jesus talk about karma? 
And then also, like, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I don't know if Jesus talked about that or that was just a religion thing that was created after him. And if Jesus, like, talked about that, did <coughs> Buddha have something similar to those okay. three? Okay, let me sort those out. Um, uh, well, I'm not aware that Jesus talked about karma, but there are, it's a very similar idea that there's ethical rewards. The rewards for what you do ethically, you know, that uh, there's good and bad, and you, the good prosper and the wicked are punished, theoretically. So it's, it's kind of like karma, but not exactly, you know. Um, the Trinity, I'm not so sure. I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't want to be quoted on whether it was, it was Jesus. I mean, Jesus talked about the Father, you know, the Father and, and myself, and uh, whether the Trinity as a doctrine probably post-dated Jesus, I would say. The church probably, you know, came up with the full doctrine, but the implications of the doctrine were there, you know, in Jesus' teaching, it seems to me. Um, and what was the other question? You, the, oh, okay. There, there is a similar thing in, 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 to the Trinity in Buddhism. The, the Buddhist, later Buddhists, in trying to understand who the Buddha was, talked about the Buddha. I mean, the early Buddhists saw the Buddha as more or less a human being who achieved extraordinary things and overcame uh, his human humanity, fulfilled his humanity, perfected himself as a human being, and reached the goal all human beings can achieve in wisdom. But later Buddhists came up with the idea of the, that the Buddha was not a human being at all, he was a cosmic phenomenon. And they talk about three bodies of the Buddha. The Buddha had a heavenly body, a body in which he, he lived, his ultimate body, the Dharma body, the body in which he lived in the heavens with the gods, and the body in which he appeared on earth, sort of three different bodies of the Buddha. So this is kind of sometimes equated, uh, the trikaya, the three bodies of the Buddha, are sometimes equated to the trinity in Christianity. Yeah. But it's kind of a complicated comparison, but you might look into that, yeah. There's a question from the internet, somebody watching on the internet. <laughs> um, why does Professor Bond think it is important for us to recognize the similarities between these great leaders? What lesson are we to learn by this connection? Are we being pointed to a greater truth that transcends these men? Um, well, I go back to what I said before. I think the, the I think it's important because it's there and people have noticed the similarities. And the question is, what do we make of them? What do we do about them? What, what significance should we attach to them? Are they Accidental, coincidental, and I went through several options as to why I think, why people have said they're important. And I think the final significance I would come down with is the one I, I ended with, that the kind of thing that Thich Nhat Hanh and Thomas Merton and others have said, that they uh, inspire us and show us how interfaith dialogue is possible and how you know, we can learn from other traditions and they can uh, fo help us inspire our search. Merton, for example, was very much inspired by Zen Buddhism. And he said the importance of studying Zen for him, and you know, if you've read about Thomas Merton, he was, toward the end of his life, he was really into studying Buddhism and made a trip to, he made a trip to Sri Lanka and saw the Buddha statue we showed before about the Polonarawa statue, uh, where, let's see if we can find that. This statue at, at Polonarawa is in Thomas Merton's Asian journal. He says that he stood before this statue and had one of the most profound religious experiences he'd ever had in contemplating the Buddha and contemplating uh, the serenity of the statue and the, the meaning of the Buddha in his life. So for Merton and for others, uh, Buddhism is a way of pointing to, Zen Buddhism for example especially, a way of pointing us away from doctrine and uh, dogma and back to experience. The idea of experiencing the truth in our lives and uh, doing what uh, the Buddha said we should do and what Zen teachers say we should do is to experience the truth and not uh, think about the truth or read about the truth, but to have, seek it spiritually and, and try to experience it. I don't know, that'd be one answer I would get. Yeah. How does one reconcile heaven, hell, heaven or, and hell, and the concept of reincarnation in an ecumenical discourse? Okay, so which, like, it seems like two different options in a way. Uh, um, 
I don't know. I don't know if you have to, but if you, uh, um, I'm, I'm, the Buddhists, I mean, for example, Buddhists, the Buddhists would say there is heaven and hell. They're just places you can be reborn. They're levels of rebirth. Um, they're not ultimate, though. Um, you can also say that for, um, you know, you can reinterpret them to say maybe heaven and hell are, you know, not places. They're, you know, states of mind. But, you know, I think there are various ways to deal with it, but uh, they are, they can be seen as very different. They can also be seen as very similar kinds of uh, answers to the problem, the afterlife. <laughs>